Look at Acts chapter 2. Now, as uh, Jason was reading that, of course, it's uh, the very famous chapter of the day of Pentecost with the disciples of Christ having the power of the Holy Ghost come upon them and them able to speak in many different languages. Okay? And Peter gets up and gives this great speech there. But I just want you to notice part of the great speech in, in verse number 22, <coughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 22, he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. A man approved of God. The title for the sermon tonight is Approved of God. Okay, Approved of God. Now the reason I wanted to preach on this, um, uh, this is basically how I live my life um, in many ways. Okay, One thing that I've noticed, obviously I've been saved since I was four years old. I didn't really grow till I was in my, I was in my 20s, roughly, you know, as a Christian. But one thing that I noticed with a lot of people, you know, I'm not even talking about the unsafety. I'm just talking about the, the saved, you know, people that are brothers and sisters in the Lord, that sometimes, you know, some believers can have a positive outlook to life and some believers can have a very negative outlook to life. You know, it's like that, you know, the, the glass, is it half full or is it half, half um, empty? You know, that kind of perspective. And I, I realized that it really taints your life. It really affects people around you how you react to certain situations. You know, something can happen in life. Just, you know, and someone looks at that event and goes, you know, has a very negative attitude to it. And it brings them down. It brings everyone around them down. And some people will just blow it off. You know, what's the difference? Well, why is it that some people can just blow things off? You know, some people make, might make a comment about you, right? They, they say something negative about you. And some people will get really offensive, you know, really offended. You know, they have very, they're very sensitive and they react very quickly to a situation. And then others, it's like, who cares? Like, why is that? What, what, have you ever wondered why is it that people react in different ways? And, the, 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 you know, the, the answer is not because the person that blows it off doesn't care. That's not the answer. Okay, it's not that the person that blows it off doesn't care. We're all made of the same flesh and blood. We all have the same feelings. We, we, we all, you know, if someone says something negative about you, it's going to affect you, of course. Okay, but obviously some react worse than others. And why is that? Why is that? And I'll tell you the secret to it. It's basically the title of the sermon. It said it's approved of God. If your concern in life is just to be approved by God, man, everything else in life is not going to bother you. Okay? If your focus is, I just want to make sure God approves of me and how I believe things, how I act, how I live my life, I'm telling you, other things in life are just not going to bother you as much as it does today. Okay? And, um, you know, another word the Bible uses um, when it comes to approval or being approved of God is the word accepted. You know, if you did a word study for approved of God or accepted by God, these two things are very similar. Okay. So the, the purpose for this sermon today is to make you a more content person. You know, to make you more happy in your life, having more confidence about the way you live your life, being steadfast. You know, not being someone that's, that's uh, you know, tossed to and fro, not someone that's, uh, you know, that's always very weak and unsure about themselves. You know, I don't want you to be overly sensitive and I don't want you to be easily offended. I mean, I think this is what everybody wants. Everyone wants to have confidence in their life, okay? And of course, the world, when they look for confidence, they look for confidence in the flesh. You know, they look for confidence in finances, how much money they make, you know, how good they look, you know, how well their body is toned. Or whatever it is, you know, people look for confidence in different areas, maybe their university degree or, you know, their, their career path. Or, and they look for confidence in all these things, but what we should be looking for is the approval of God. That's the key thing that we should be striving for. Now, if you can just turn to Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, verse 11. Romans chapter 2, verse 11. The first thing we need to talk about, just very quickly, I want to just, you know, obviously tell this message to believers. But the first way that you are, you're approved of God is the way where, of course, common sense is salvation. You know, needing to be saved, you know, because as an unsaved person, you are not approved of God. There's nothing you can bring to the table where God will say, hey, yeah, that's acceptable. I'll, I'll take that, you know, as, as, uh, as your entrance into the kingdom of God, into eternity, you know, to have salvation. No, the Bible says in Romans 2, 11, for there is no respect of persons with God. There is no respect of persons with God. There's nothing you can bring. You know, as an unsaved person without Christ, there's nothing that you can do or show of yourselves, your finances, like I said, your strength, 
your good looks. There's nothing that God will turn around and say, wow, I approve of that. Okay? I respect that. No, God is not a respecter of persons. And look, if God is not a respecter of persons, do you think we should be respecter of persons? No, we shouldn't, right? I mean, the only way you can be approved by God is salvation, is to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you know, first and foremost. And of course, once you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, you know, you know that God is not a respecter of persons. Don't you become a respecter of persons, okay? If we're striving to be more godly, striving to be more like Jesus Christ, then that's something we need to aim for, okay? Not to respect persons, but to seek the approval or the acceptance of God. Now go to Luke chapter 20, please. Luke chapter 20. And I'm going to read to you from Proverbs 28 verse 21. You guys go to Luke 20. I'm going to read to you from Proverbs 28 verse 21. The Bible says, To have respect of persons is not good, for for a, pro, a, a piece of bread that man will transgress. It says, look, if you, if you lift up, if you respect somebody, or if you're seeking the respect of a person, it says it's not good. It's not something we should be doing as believers. Because that same person will basically transgress or commit sin or do wrong for a piece of bread. There's that, there's that saying that everyone has a price. You know, that everyone will commit sin for some value of something. Now look, the truth is, I'm sure we've all committed sins for something as stupid or as insignificant as a piece of bread. It's very difficult because this is the flesh that we walk in, right? Sometimes there are some sins we struggle with, we're really trying to fight against it, and maybe we still fall, and there are some other things that we just do like that, you know, we've, you know just so insignificant to us, we commit that sin. And that's why we shouldn't respect people, because they're not perfect. They're all sinners. We're all sinners. You know, and the only one we ought to seek out the respect or approval for from is God. Now, in Luke chapter 20, verse 21, Luke chapter 20, verse 21, this is when Jesus Christ is in the temple. This is the last week before he's being crucified. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are sending their disciples to try to trip up Jesus Christ. They're asking him many questions to see, you know, trying to find where he can fail, trying to find a reason to accuse him of. And this is what they say of Jesus in verse 21. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly. Now, these guys are, are not genuine. They're not, they're not saying this with a genuine heart, okay? But what they're saying is true, okay? What they're saying is true, but they're not saying with any, with any genuineness, okay? They're trying to find fault in Jesus. But then it says this. So they acknowledge that he teaches rightly. Neither acceptest thou the person of any, but teachest the way of God truly. Now, do you want to be people that know the way of God truly? Do you want to be people that teach rightly, that know rightly what the Word of God says? You know, you want to base your faith and practice in life on the Word of God. And you want to be as true to the Word of God as possible. If that's you, then what was said of Jesus? It said there, um, neither acceptest thou the person of any. So they're acknowledging, Jesus, when you teach, when you preach, you don't care about the thoughts of others. You know, you don't care how they're going to get offended by your preaching. You don't care about their opinions. You just seem to care about teaching the Word of God. You know, and that's my job as your pastor. You know, to get behind the pulpit. And, you know, yes, you know, I, I, I do care for you. I do love you. You know, but that shouldn't stop me from preaching the Word of God truly. Okay, that shouldn't stop me. And, oh, I better compromise. I better not say these things because I know brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is struggling in this area. I'm not going to talk about that or sugarcoat around it because I don't want to offend them. No, that's not how a preacher ought to be. That's not how a teacher ought to be. And the same for you. When you come to the Word of God, you know, and, and you know you have your faults and problems, you need to be someone that says, you know what, regardless of my faults and problems, I'm going to read the Word of God and I'm going to take it for what it says. And it, if it offends me, so be it. Because if it offends me, that's awesome. Because now I know that's an area of my life that I need to change. Okay? We need to build our faith and practice. Of course, your faith is what you believe. Your practice is how you live out your life. You know, based on the Word of God. Seeking the approval that God gives us. And we see what was said of Jesus. He was approved of God. And he preached the truth regardless of who it may affect. Who it may offend. All right? Now, please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
because there's, there is a third category to this. There are those that, you know, we, we should be striving to seek God's approval. There are those that seek the approval of men. But then you've got a third category. They're the self-approvers. They approve of themselves. Okay? They, they, they love to speak of themselves. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, the Bible says, <clears throat> But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 10, 17. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Hey, and this is what's going to give you a positive outlook in life. Is when you, when you glory about things, don't glory about this world. No, don't glory about these earthly things because it's all going to come to an end. It's all temporal. Find your glory in the Lord. But then it says in verse 18, For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Okay? So someone that goes around commending themselves, you know, speaking highly of themselves, you know, seeking, you know, self-promoters, it said here that the Lord does not commend him. You know, they're commending himself. That person is not approved by God. Okay? And that is what some people fall into because they care about how others feel. They care about what others have to say about themselves. And what? No one else? No one's saying anything nice about me. No one's saying anything positive about me. But I want to look good in front of others. Well, if no one's going to do it, I'm going to promote myself. I'm going to speak highly of myself. I'm going to talk about all the great things that I've done. You know, and, and, and by doing that, you sort of put people in a corner. Because, look, have you ever been next to someone that just keeps promoting themselves, keeps talking themselves up? You kind of feel rude to say, hey, you know, you shouldn't talk like that. You know, you're sort of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you've done great. You know, they're seeking that kind of approval from you as well. Hey, but the Lord does not commend that person. The Lord does not lift up that person. All right. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, if you can turn there if you want, Matthew 6, verse 1. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. By the way, there's, there's two ways of being a self-approver. One way is to commend themselves. One way is to approve and lift themselves up. I'll go to the second one in, in a moment. But just in Matthew 6, verse 1, Matthew 6, verse 1, it says, Take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them. So arms are your good works. You know, when you do your good works before men, <clears throat> uh, or do not do your, your good works before men to be seen of men. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Okay, so what do you want in your life? Do you want God to see your works? Do you want God to reward you? Or do you want man to see your works and for man to reward you? Those, those are your options. Those are your options. And if you promote yourself in front of man, if you talk highly about your great works, then your reward will be from men and it won't be from God. Verse number two. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Hey, we're meant to, what are we meant to glory in? We're meant to glory in the Lord. But these guys are looking for the glory of men. Verse number three. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Man, if you can just take this on board, just this one principle from Jesus, it's going to change your life. It's going to change your life. Because it's natural when you do something good. It's natural. It's natural, okay? When you do something good, it's natural to want people to see the good and say, well done, and give you a pat on the back. It's, it's natural, okay? Because, you, you know, you, you do it, and it's like, well, did anyone see that? You know? But here's the thing. It's better if it's in secret. And you know that someone has seen it. It's always God who sees it. Okay, and this will change everything, I promise you. You start thinking like this. God sees everything that I do. God sees all my good works. You know, and if God sees my good works, God will approve of my works. God rewarded my works. It doesn't matter what happens outside of that. Hey, if I do good works and someone criticizes me, it doesn't matter because God saw my good works. God will reward me accordingly. Okay, but here's the thing. When someone speaks bad of our good works, oh, I can't believe he said that. I can't believe they said that about me. Why? Because you're seeking the approval of men. And that's going to get you downcast. That's going to cause you to have a negative outlook in life. All right? Now, please go to Isaiah 43. Turn to Isaiah 43. The second way people um, seek acceptance or approval of men is not that they just lift themselves up for their good works, but they seek acceptance for the bad that they have done. They seek acceptance for the bad that they've done. 
You know, they'll go, you know, look, we've all, not all, but some have lived a more sinful life than others, okay? Some have made some serious mistakes compared to others. And, you know, don't be this kind of person. Don't be the kind of person that keeps bringing up your mistakes, that keeps bringing up all your past sins to other people, okay? Because, look, think about this. If, if let's say I lived, a, I had a really horrible, I got in jail, I was a drug addict and I was uh, stealing cars and all this stuff. And I just kept saying to you guys, oh man, I messed up my life. You know, I was such a sinner. You know, I did all these horrible things. You know, I wish someone gave me the gospel early in my life. I wish I had direction for my parents. You know, I wish all these things. What are they seeking? They're looking for you to go, it's okay, brother. It's okay. God understands. No, look, whether you've, you know, if you've sinned, if you've done wickedness, whether you knew the word of God or whether you didn't know the word of God, it was wrong to do, it was still a sin. You know, don't go seeking for others' approval to say, well, God understands why you were like that. God understands your situation. Look, of course God understands. That's why he had to send Jesus Christ to come and pay for the sins, your sins on the cross. Okay, they've been handled, they've been taken care of, they've been nailed to the cross. It's time for you to let go of it. You don't need to keep bringing it up to people, seeking for people to feel sorry for you, to support you, pat you on the back. Let go of it, all right? Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far have God removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, it never meets. Okay, so that's how far God has removed our transgressions. Why do you want to keep bringing it back? God wants to get rid of it. God wants to be done with it. He's done with it, you know? You guys are in Isaiah 43, verse 25. Isaiah 43, verse 25. It says, I, even I, this is God speaking, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. God says, look, when I've forgiven you, look, not only have I forgiven you, I've forgotten about it. I don't remember them anymore. I don't bring them back to remembrance. You know, God doesn't, look, God doesn't want to keep remembering your sins. He wants to forget it. He wants to put it, put it behind him. He wants you to put it behind him. Okay. And look, God has forgiven you. That should be sufficient. It should be sufficient for you to know that God has paid for my sins, that he's removed it from me, that he's forgotten about it. Therefore, I'm going to forget about them. I'm going to move on with my life. I'm not going to keep bringing it up because when you keep bringing it up, this is what's going to give you a negative outlook to life. Okay. What you should be thinking about is, praise God, they're paid for. That will give you a positive outlook on life. Amen. Okay, you think about what God has done for you. Glory in the Lord. Okay, don't go trying to, rant, you know, trying to seek people's opinions and approval. Oh, yeah, it's all understood. Look, don't worry about it. It's been dealt with. Okay, it's been dealt with. Your sins have been dealt with. You don't need to keep bringing it up to everybody's face, you know, and causing them to remember. Look, people are going to have a bad outlook on you. <laughs> you keep bringing up the past. You know, we all have past. We all have made mistakes but they've been paid for by Jesus Christ. So moving on to the next point, um, I'll get you guys to turn to Acts chapter 10, please. Acts chapter 10. Because the question will become, you know, well, how then do I find myself approved of God and not seeking that after man? What do I need to do? You know, how is it that I need to find myself approved? I'm not talking about an unsaved person. We're talking about saved people today, right? And how do I find myself approved of God and how do I prevent myself seeking it from man? I've got basically two points for this. But uh, go to uh, Acts 10.34. Acts 10.34. Acts 10.34. <clears throat> the Bible reads, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Hey, how how is it that you want to be accepted by God? How is it that you want to be approved by God? Well, it said here that you must first fear Him. You must first fear God and work His righteousness. You know, fear God and work righteousness. That's step number one, okay? That's step number one. Why? Why is that? Because here's the thing. If you fear God in the right measure, if you fear God, you're not going to fear man. Okay, if you fear what God has to say about your life, if you're concerned about how God sees your life and the things, the areas that you're not doing well in, the, you know, it's going to cause you, if you have a fear of God, it's just going to naturally cause you to say, well, 
man, I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid of the terror of the Lord there. I better do what's right. I better walk in accordance to his commands. I better do things as I see them in the scriptures. That's what's going to strive you to do it, is when you have a healthy fear of God. That's going to override your fear of man. Okay? Because here's the reason, here's the reason why you don't do certain things that God asks you to do. It's because you've got a fear of man. What's man going to say? If I do these things, if I put this into place, what's man going to say? Hey, that's the fear of man. No, you've got to have the fear of God. Okay, the fear of God is greater than the fear of man. All right? If you have the right balance of the fear of God, you're not going to worry about what men have to say about you. And you're going to be driven to walk in righteousness, to do the works of righteousness that God has asked you to do. Please turn to Romans 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Hey, God wants us to uh, use our bodies as a sacrifice for Him. Okay? You say, well, that's too much work. It says here, holy, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says, look, you offering yourself as a sacrifice. Doing the things that God has asked you to do is your reasonable service. He's not asking too much. This, is, this makes perfect sense. For what God has done for you, surely you can give something back to Him. Surely you can uphold His word and walk in His ways. And then verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How is it that you know what's acceptable to God? You must renew your mind, right? And prove, okay? Every area of your life, prove it. Whatever it is that you do, <coughs> prove it. Is this aligned with what God wants me to do? Is this what God wants me to do? Whatever it is that you set your heart on, your hands upon, is this what God finds approved, you know, or is it not? You know, is this aligned with His perfect will? or not you know have i renewed my mind enough or not so that's step number one step step number one is to fear god and work righteousness okay now step number two if you guys can go to second timothy chapter two please second timothy chapter two verse 14 second timothy chapter two verse 14 the second step and i've already kind of covered this as we're leading into this is make the bible the basis of your faith and practice Make the Bible the basis of your faith and practice. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. The Bible says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they may, that they may <clears throat> that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. And look at this. Study, study, study what the word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth but shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness all right so god says look study know the word of god why is it i why is it that i believe this oh uh, because pastor kevin preached it no that's wrong okay yes you may have learned it from pastor kevin but the reason you know this to be true is because it's what the bible says and i can turn to the scriptures and show you the bible says this this is why I believe that, okay? Well, why is it that you homeschool your kids or whatever? Well, the Bible says that I should be training my kids from sunrise to sunset, all right? That means they're going to be in the presence of mom and dad. You know, they're not going to be put away in some institution. They're going to be raised by mom and dad. I've got my reasons behind that, let alone how evil and wicked the, you know, our society is, the schools are these days. You know, I've got my reasons behind that. You know, it's built upon the Word of God. It's not because other families in the church are homeschooling and I'm feeling the pressure now, I've got to homeschool because, yeah, man, what are they going to think of me? Hey, that's the fear of man. No. You know, that's not why you homeschool. And, that, you know, people that homeschool for the wrong reasons because they feel the pressure from church, they're the ones that give up homeschooling because they're not doing it based on the Word of God. They're not building their faith and practice on the Word of God. And, uh, <coughs> you see, one thing, we talk about the Christian life. And of course, if you live a Christian life, there are challenges, okay? God has a high standard. 
But also, the Christian life in many ways is very easy. It's, it's, it's very easy in many ways, okay? And what, what, what do I mean by that? It's because, you know, ungodly, worldly people without Christ, they have to make the same decisions in life that we all have to, you know, looking for work, getting married, you know, whatever, you know, raising the kids and whatever people do with life. You know, everyone's got to make a decision and, and decide how they're going to go about doing things. And one thing that's great about being a Christian is because I got the Bible, I don't need to worry myself so much. Am I doing the right thing or the wrong thing? If I can just find it in the Bible, that's what God says. Oh, that's the right thing. Like, it's just a burden that's off my shoulders. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to struggle. Is this right or wrong? You know? And, um, you know, I, I don't stress about, you know, asking the question, you know, as a, as a man, should I be the one working? As a man, should I be the one providing for my family? Or should I be sending my wife out there instead? Is that, is that what I, you know, I, I don't need to, it's answered. The Bible, the Bible has answered that for me, okay? That, that's the requirement, that's the responsibility of the man, you know? Or disobedient children, you know? What's the right, should I watch Super Nanny? Is that, you know, am I going to get the right ways out of discipline kids on Super Nanny? Should I, should I do the timeouts or, you know, should I, oh, they, they done that. I wonder, should we take privilege? Privilege, we've got to take privileges away from them or take toys away from them, things that they like. You know, no, I don't, it's answered for me. Get the rod of correction, the Bible says. You know, take out the rod and, and spank your kids. Answered. I don't have to worry about what the right or wrong answer is. I know what the right answer is. All right? Uh, you know, should I, should I be in support of homosexual marriage? You know, the, the, our government had that plebiscite. You know, when was that? Two years ago? A year and a half ago? The pleb Look, the government doesn't know what's right or wrong. Let's go ask everybody else what they think. You know, I'm not there wondering, oh, should I put yes or no? You know, uh, what's the answer there? The answer, it's answer. They should be stoned to death. That's the answer. <laughs> it's not about marriage. It's about being stoned to death. That's what the answer, that's what the Bible says. I don't, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to stress about those kinds of questions in life. And that's what, you know, being a Christian is, is easy in one way. Because you know, the right, as long as you know the Bible, of course, you, you know the right answer to those things. And you know what? That will give you confidence in life. It will give you confidence when you go about doing something, Oh, do you spank your kids? Oh, man, I'm going to report you to them. Had, I've had that you know, said to me at work. Oh, Kevin, how do you raise your kids? How are they so well behaved? Well, we, we spank them. We get the right. What? I'm going to report you to the to docs. It's like, well, you just told me how good they were. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> you know, no, I, don't, I don't worry about those kinds of things. You know, I know what God says. It gives me confidence. You know, I'll just, I don't beat around the bush. It's what I do. You know, get out there and I say, what? Did your parents never give you a good smack? Oh, yeah, they did. Well, what? You turned out okay right? You know, and you know, it gives you confidence in life. You're never wondering about things, you know? I, I remember a few years ago, this, uh, this book, this novel, The Da Vinci Code came out. This Da Vinci Code. It's a fictional book. A fictional book about Jesus getting married to Mary, Mary Magdalene. Apparently, they found evidence that, they found the evidence of Jesus' tomb, and in the tomb, it said that Mary Magdalene was his wife, and they had a son, so they had descendants or something like that. I don't know. So anyway, some guy writes a fictional book about it, and, uh, I remember it being like a big news, like it was going around, you know, and like, oh, wow, this new evidence and blah, blah. And I'm like, who cares? <laughs> I, I know what the Bible says. I know that Jesus died, rose again from the dead, and then he ascended up to be on the right, left, uh, yeah, the right hand side of the Father, you know? I mean, or seated at the right hand of the Father, you know? But uh, like, I'm not worried about oh, Da Vinci Code. Maybe they've discovered something new. Maybe that's going to unsettle my faith in the Bible. No, who cares? That's not nonsense. Why am I going to waste my time on that stuff? But that's what people get unsettled. I'm telling you, Christians get unsettled with those things because they haven't got the confidence in the Word of God. You know, I don't get unsettled if, if uh, on the news they discover some new evolutionary missing link. You know, oh, see, this proves that men came from apes or something. It doesn't unsettle me. Who cares? I know what the Word of God says. I know the, word, you know, the, the world's about 6,000 some years old and that, you know, Adam and Eve were our, our, forefather, our, our first father and mother. And I, I'm not unsettled by that kind of information. But, you know, some Christians are. Some Christians are unsettled by that, you know. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying to you. If you know the Word of God, if you build your faith and practice on the Word of God, it's going to give you confidence. It's not going to cause you to be, you know, uncomfortable or, or wondering or doubting and, and, and having that negative outlook to life. No, it's not going to do that, you know. If everybody in the world, if nobody in the world homeschooled their kids, I'm not going to stop homeschooling my kids because I know why I'm doing it. You know, I've built it upon the Word of God. I have confidence. That's the best way to raise my children. And when you base it upon the Word of God, it's also going to give you thicker skin. It's going to make you less sensitive, less offended. 
by the words of others, okay? What they say is not going to bother you as much. Or it shouldn't, it will bother you to some extent. It always will, a little bit. But you're going to have better control of your emotions. You're going to have better control because you know you're doing it in accordance to the Word of God. That's what matters. I want to know that I'm approved of God. I don't care about the approval of men, you know? And, you know, this, I'm sure you've all experienced this. You know, I mean, just, I mentioned homeschool. I mentioned just, you know, my, my wife staying home and raising the kids. You know, just these little things, disciplining your kids. The, the, the human, like the stuff that people have been doing for thousands of years, right? But people now look at it, it's like, oh man, you know, what, what kind of world do you live in? You know, I, you know, you're raising your kids in this bubble and, you know, they're going to be traumatized. for their, Look, I have confidence my kids are going to turn out okay. I have confidence that my marriage is going to be strong because we're basing the things that we do on the Word of God. It doesn't matter if my brother, and I'm not saying my brothers have done this, but it doesn't matter if my closest relatives are saying, hey, you know, that's a bad way of doing it. You shouldn't put your kids, you know, your kids are missing out on, 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 social, on social activities at school. They're, they're not going to get the teaching. Well, I don't care. I mean, you can feel that way. I actually, and this is a positive outlook. I appreciate that you actually care about the family, that that concerns you. I actually appreciate that. But I don't care about how you say those things because I know why I'm doing it. I know that it's built on the Word of God. And if God says that's okay, I'm all for it. I have the confidence. I'm not going to be shaken by that. Okay? But here's the thing. When you don't have the confidence in the Word of God, when they say those things, it's going to cause you to get unsettled. How dare they say that about me? How dare they say that I'm a bad parent? Who cares? Who cares what they say? You care about what God says. That's what you should care about. I promise, if you can apply this to your life, you're going to have a much happier life. You're going to be have so much more positivity about you, you know. And uh, you guys, Jason mentioned that I smile a lot. You know, now I'm giving you, you know, living your best life now, how to remain positive. I'm becoming more like, what's the guy's name? Joel Osteen, yeah. My sermons are becoming more Joel Osteen. <laughs> it's not, but look, this is important. You know, it's important. God's given us this life. God's given us this time on the earth. You know, he doesn't want us to go around moping and complaining and whinging and being easily offended all the time. God wants us to live confident lives in accordance to his word. <clears throat> now, one thing I do want to say, one thing that I've noticed as a pattern amongst people is, and this is not obviously a, a hard and fast rule, but I've noticed this, is that people that have grown up in a broken home or people that have grown up without their fathers, you know, um, or without just a, just without a good, godly, or, uh, you know, manly father in their life, I just noticed that a lot of these people tend to look for the approval of people more than the average person. Like, more than the average person that's grown up in a decent home with mum and dad there, and, you know, dad, and they've been, you know, mum and dad have, have given them approval, have given them confidence in life. You know, they tend to not be bothered so much by the words of others. But people that didn't grow up in, a, in the best home environment, they tend to be looking for the approval of other people. Okay? And that's something that I need to realize as well. You know, it's, it's just that you know, some, some times in life, some people's, you know, the way things worked out for them, unfortunately, have been more difficult than others. You know, I'm thankful that God's given me a godly father and mother. You know, I appreciate that. But I also acknowledge that other people have not had the same life that I've had. Okay? And that may cause them to be more sensitive, to be more easily offended, and these kinds of things. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it's still true. The way to have a positive outlook in life, the way to be confident, okay, is to build your faith and practice on the Word of God, regardless, okay? The Word of God has the answer for all of us, okay, in how we ought to progress and live our lives. Please take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. <coughs> Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in the knowledge and in all judgment. Okay? So, he wants our love to be abounded more and more, but that love needs to be based on something. It says in knowledge and in judgment. Again, that's coming from the Word of God. Verse 10, That ye may, approve, that ye may approve things that are excellent. Okay? He wants, the, 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 if we want to be approved of God, we need to make sure that the things that we do are excellent. Okay, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness 
which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. You see, the more you approve things in excellence, according to knowledge and judgment, it said there, that you're going to be without offense. Okay? That means you're going to be less likely to offend people, but at the same time, you're less likely to take the offense. You know, be easily offended because you're building upon things that are approved in excellence. Okay? Now, what I want to talk about here quickly is that I just want to talk to you about how to handle people that practice things differently to you, that do things differently to you, and how you should respond to that with love, okay, with love. And uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of this, and, and I'm not saying this, you know, I'm not trying to take, if this is an example that's happening in this church, you know, I, I don't know, okay, it's just, just by accident, okay, but I'm, I'm just talking about things that happen all the time, in every church, in every, in, all the time when you have families gathered together, and people talk and people have strong opinions of their beliefs, strong opinions about how they should ought to live life. And I'll give you one example. You know, you know one mother might say to another mother, you know, oh, I, I bought my daughter a, a smartphone. You know, I bought my da- daughter a smartphone on her birthday. You know, and look, some parents would not approve of that. Okay? Some parents would say, well, no, why would you do that? You know? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, this is where you need to be mindful. Okay? You need to be mindful because... That child is not your child, okay? The mother that bought the smartphone for that child is the authority in that person's life, okay? It's up to them. It's their decision, okay? And they probably feel this is fine. This is good. You know, this is something that that, that they need for life. It's going to make our our lives easier or whatever. But then you may feel, oh, I would never do that. You know, that's not something that I would do. So how do you respond? How do you respond? Well, I'll tell you not how to respond. I'll tell you how not to respond. You know, I would never buy that for my daughter. You know, don't you know the problems that she can develop? Don't you know, you know how, you know how I don't know, whatever. You know, that it has this problem. It will cause this in her life. It will cause that in her life. Don't you know? I would never do that. They never ask for your opinion. Who cares? All right, that's not how you respond. And if you're that type of person that responds that way. It's because you haven't, got the, you, you haven't built your approval upon God. You see, what people get triggered about how other people live their lives. They get triggered because they haven't got confidence in themselves in how they live their life. Okay? And so when another family does something differently to how they feel, for them it's like a slap in the face on them. It's like, well, you're giving them a phone, but I wouldn't do that. What, are you saying that I'm the bad parent? No, we're not talking, I'm just talking, I gave her a phone. That's what happened. <laughs> I bought her a present because I love my daughter. That's what happened. It's got nothing to do about you, okay? But the wrong response is, I would never do such a thing. No, because here it is, you're, 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 you've got thin skin, you're highly sensitive, okay? You haven't got confidence in the Word of God and how you live your life, and you want to seek approval from other people. And so when other people are not living like the way you would live, it, it unsettles you. It unsettles you. And if that's you... That means you're a respecter of persons. You're looking for approval from other people rather than having the confidence that comes from knowing the Word of God and living your life according to the God's Word. Amen. All right? Now, how should you respond if you don't approve of it? You know, well, maybe don't say anything. <laughs> maybe don't say anything. All right? Or you could just say, you know what? Yeah, you know, for our kids, we just don't think it's, it's right for them at this point in time to have phones. But hey, if your kid's mature enough to handle that, good on. That's the way. That's the best way to respond. You know, and here's the thing as well that I've noticed with some Christians. <clears throat> We're meant to love one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And sometimes, you know, you may do something or you do, you know, practice something or whatever that I don't approve of. But I know about it. But I don't approve of it, okay? I, I mean, I wouldn't do it in my life. But then, should I just ignore that a- aspect of your life? Should I just say, well, I don't approve of it, therefore I'm not going to bring it up, I'm not going to mention it, I'm not going to ask them how that's going? No, because I'm meant to love you. Okay? And if you're doing something that's a major part of your life that I don't think is right, but you're doing it anyway, hey, I'm still going to go up to you and say, hey, how's that situation? How's that thing going that you're going, that's going on there? Is there anything you know, that I can help you out with? Is there anything I can pray for? Whatever it is, why? Because I, I'm meant to love you. Okay? I don't need to necessarily approve of every decision you make in your life. You need to be making your decisions based on what the Word of God says, not how Pastor Kevin Sepulveda feels or anyone else in the family, you know, anyone, any other family in the church feels. All right? The last thing that I want to talk about here is if you seek God's approval, it's going to give you stability. It's 
going to give you stability. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Actually, it's not the last thing, it's the second last thing. Stability. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. I'll just read through this quickly. The Bible says, Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. And what I want to bring to your attention here, guys, is that we can have stability. The Bible says here that the kingdom of God, which we received, cannot be moved. Okay? The kingdom that we're part of is stable. Okay? We can have stability in our lives. We can have that confidence in our lives because we know God's word will never change. We know how God feels about something today is the same way he feels about it forever. The same way he felt about it in the book of Genesis is the same way he's going to feel about it when we live out Revelation. You know, we can have confidence in his kingdom. And once we've entered the kingdom, we have the confidence that we'll never leave that kingdom because it's everlasting life. Okay, it gives us confidence to stand in the kingdom that God has given us. You see, what I want to bring to your attention here is that this world is not our home. Okay, this temporal world is not our home. Okay, and look, I'm not, I've got a house. We've been able to purchase a house. But here's what happens. A lot of Christians feel the strain. They feel the pressure. I've got to buy a house. But why? This is not your home. Okay, this is not your home. Your home, what's going to give you stability is the kingdom of God. It's not owning a house that's going to give you stability. Okay? Now, if you're able to do it, go for it. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying, hey, make sure your, your mind is in the right place. Because I see believers become unstable. I see believers become, you know, uh, uh, feel, feel uh, you know, not important. Okay? Because they, they don't own a property. Who cares? It's all going to get burnt up. The house I own, I own is going to get burnt up one day. All right? I don't care. I want, I want the mansions that God's prepared for me. Oh, that is, okay? So, stability. You know, getting the approval of God. You know, making sure that you're adding your golden bricks in heaven, whatever your treasures in heaven look like, that you're working toward that. That's what's going to get God's approval in your life, rather than you worrying about temporal, material things. You know? First Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Just read it quickly. To whom coming as unto a living stone... Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, talking about you, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We're talking about before, you know, your body being that living sacrifice, okay? Acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture... Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So I just want to draw from that is your stability comes from Christ. Your stability comes from Jesus Christ. Hey, God wants to build you as a lively stone, but he wants you to be built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Okay, you walk in, in the ways of Jesus Christ, you're going to have stability. You're going to be strong. The same way that Jesus Christ was strong, he was able to face his enemies. People that were seeking to kill him, he was able to speak to them with strength. But he also had compassion. He also had love. He had a great balance of all these qualities in his life. And that's, what's, that's what gave Jesus stability. Hey, Jesus did not have a house. Jesus did not have a house. He didn't have a place to rest his head. Okay, but he's the most stable person you're going to read in the Bible. Okay, he had the perfect balance in life. Okay, nobody could trip him over. He knew exactly what his mission was and he knew to teach the word of God without compromise. Your stability comes from Jesus Christ. And lastly, can you guys turn to 1 Peter chapter 2? 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 20. If you seek the approval of God, it's going to help you in personal attacks. In personal attacks, okay, that come to you. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For what glory is this? Is it? Sorry, for what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Hey, what's acceptable with God? We want to be approved of God, right? We want to be acceptable with God. What is it? That you get buffered when you do well. Hey, when you do what's right, 
and you get criticized, you get attacked, you get persecuted for doing right. Okay? The Bible says here, if you take it patiently, hey, if you don't lose your, your cool, you know, you, you don't let it bother you, you don't get frustrated, you take it patiently, it says, hey, that's acceptable with God. That's, what, that's where God wants you to be in life. Okay? That anybody can say anything about you, it's like, who cares? I care what God says. That's where God wants you to be. Okay? If you can do that, man, you're going to live so much of a more happier life. Instead of you being concerned, how, why does that person feel that way? If it doesn't bother you, it's going to bother them. That it doesn't bother you. Okay? It's going to be upon them rather than upon you. You're carrying all these things, you know, the, these concerns. Did you know so-and-so said that about you? Did you know they said that about you? I don't care. I know what God says and I'm doing according to what God says. I'm doing what's good. Hey, and that's acceptable to God. Hey, that's acceptable to God. What, you know, praise God for this because otherwise you're going to be thinking that life is about fixing all these, all these fires that are burning around you and you've got to do your, you know, your job to fix them. No, don't worry. You walk in the path that God has given you, okay? And you do the works that God has given you to do. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen Christians get flustered, you know? They do something good to someone and that person, and look, you've all been there. You've done something good for someone, and they've never thanked you for it. They never showed appreciation for it. Maybe you've gone out of your length to, to really help someone out, and they've just been like, ah, whatever. They just showed no appreciation whatsoever. Now tell me, how would you feel? How would you react when that happened? How did you react when that happened? Did you get all flustered? I can't believe, you know, I, I did the best for them. I tried to help them out. And why don't they, can't they even say thank you? Can't they even turn around and just appreciate what I did? How did you react? I would say that's how you probably reacted. Because that, that's how I've reacted before, right? That's how I reacted before. Hey, but here's the thing, you know, and I've, I've seen people say this, you know, I've done, I've helped them. Why can't they acknowledge the good that's been done? Well, if you've done good, that should be sufficient. Okay, regardless if they appreciate it or not. That should, if you've done good, if you've done the best you can, Okay, if you've shown love, you know, uh, charity, courtesy to people, and they've just wasted it, well, guess who saw it? God saw it. God saw it. If you did good, you know you did good, and God knows that you did good, and that should be enough for you. You need to get to that point where that's enough for you, okay? And if it's not enough for you, you're still saying, that person must say it, thank you! That person, no, you've, you're not going to live a happy life. You're always going to be negative. Always. Because people are always going to let you down. Always. Okay? It's always going to happen. You've got to learn that's life. People are going to let you down in life, but God's never going to let you down. Okay? God's never going to let you down. And uh, in conclusion, turn to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. I'll just end on this one because I like it. It says here, We are confident. Are you guys confident? In the Lord, in the Word of God, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So we see here that their eyes are on eternity. Hey, they'd rather be in eternity. They'd rather be in heaven right now than on the earth. But then it says in verse 9, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Okay, Whether present on this earth or absent in heaven, he says, hey, we are striving to be accepted by Him. Okay? And I want that to be your desire. I want that to really be your desire in life. You know? um, because there are people that will say, I just want to be with God right now. I, I just want to be. I just, Jesus, just come back right now. I just want to be with Him right now. Hey, that's a good desire to have. Okay? But if that's all you're desiring, you're going to miss out on living for God on this earth. Okay? And God wants you to be accepted of Him, both absent and present. Okay, so please use your time wisely. We only have a few short years of life. Okay, let's try to enjoy life. Try to be positive. The more positive you are about life, the more you're able to achieve and do for the Lord. Okay, and then you can be with the Lord forever. It's all going to be good then. Okay, hey, but great. If you suffer for Him today, greater rewards in heaven. You know, greater rewards in heaven. And look, you're going to teach your kids, you're going to teach other people around, just have thicker skins. You know, instead of those little things bothering you all the time, and getting everyone down, it's going to be like, you know what? God says I'm doing right. I know I'm doing right. Hey, and if you're not doing right according to God, well, I know I need to change that. All right, good. Okay? But that's what makes Christianity so easy, is we know what God says. All right? 
Am I walking in God's ways? Yep. I'm not walking in God's ways? Well, I need to fix that. That's how life should be. Don't worry about what other people are saying around you, okay? Don't let it bother you. Let's pray.